Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar, which is on soil erosion and sedimentation control plan review uh, and design virtual refresher training. Uh, my name is Ryan Blazik. I'm with Eagles Environmental Support Division. I'm just going to be helping to facilitate this webinar today. Um, but before we get started, I just have a couple of logistical things to go through. Uh, for those of you who haven't used uh, GoToWebinar or been part of these webinars before, all lines are muted. Uh, you can submit your questions using the question box in your GoTo toolbar. So you'll see that on the right-hand side of the screen, just select questions, type your question in, and send it over to us. Uh, we will have kind of a little Q&A after kind of each module. And then we are recording this webinar. I'll be following up uh, with a link to the recording probably a couple days after the webinar. Uh, and then there will also be several poll questions that we'll be asking kind of throughout. And I'm going to start with our first one here. It's an easy one. And the question is, how many people, including you, are watching at your location? So please uh, take a quick minute, uh, select that, uh, one, two, three, four, or five, or more. And this just helps give us a better idea how many people we have on the line, kind of for our record keeping purposes. I'll go just a couple more seconds, and then I'll close the poll out. And in case you're interested, uh, here's the results. You know, the vast majority of you are well, probably still on watching this from your computer or at your office. So with that, I'm going to close that out. And I would like to invite uh, Cheryl Petrowski-Wilson, who is the Soil Erosion and Sedimentation Control Program Specialist for EGLE, uh, to go ahead and kick off the webinar. Thanks, Ryan. As Ryan said, my name is Cheryl Petrasky wilson I'm the Soil Erosion and Sedimentation Control Program Specialist for the state. Um, I've been working with the state in this program for almost 17 years. Um, so I want to thank you all again for joining us today in the SESC refresher course that we're going to put on. Um, and I'll give you a little background as to how we got here and why we're here. Some of you might remember back in the day when you used to have your what we would refer to as the comprehensive soil erosion and sedimentation control certification. Every five years, you would have to renew it. And in order to renew it, you would have to come in and retest. So approximately five or six years ago, we changed that. And we came up with the idea to have a refresher course instead of the exam. The idea behind that was to open the communication between the people that have the certifications and uh, the agency staff and so we can talk about different issues that we were seeing in different locations or things that were maybe happening more in your area than other places. Um, so we had done that for a few years and then COVID hit and everything had to be moved online. So over the last two years, our group has been working on um, creating these webinar events to put on to where we can open that communication again between us and you know everybody that has the certification. Um, so the idea behind today is this will be a review. We sent it out to majority of the people that were up for renewal this year for their certifications. But um, as we explained to a lot of people, this was open to anybody that actually wanted to take part in it. Um, so our idea today is just to go on and do um, an overview of the program and then have that question and answer period where we can answer some of the questions you might have or reach out to you after the presentation to further discuss maybe some of the concerns or issues um, you're seeing. So the way we're going to do it today is we're going to, we have three different modules. We have three soil erosion staff from um, around the state. We have Jake Riley. Mike Kraut and Danielle McLean that are going to present. Um, we'll watch the module, do some poll questions, and then those individuals will have an open discussion regarding the information um, in the module that you just watched. And then we have the question and answer period. So I hope you guys enjoy it as much as we've enjoyed putting it together. Um, and I think it I think it'll be a good time for everybody. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jake Riley to start. Um, give his introduction on himself and then we'll start module one. Thanks Cheryl. So I'm Jake Riley, like Cheryl said, I cover uh, the northern uh, northwest part of the lower peninsula out of the Cadillac district office. 
Um, so what we're going to do with my section, we'll watch the module one video, which is a refresher of the soil erosion manual. And then I will touch on some uh, important key points that I think uh, covers that section and we'll do some question and answer. All right, thanks, Jake. I'm gonna go ahead and show the video. Welcome to the virtual comprehensive soil erosion and sedimentation control plan review and design refresher course. This course is designed to cover three modules. The modules we will be covering are as follows. Module one is a review of SESC materials covered in the manual and a discussion of how and why these matter from a plan review and design perspective. Module two is a review of soil erosion and sedimentation control plan review and design, including how to avoid bad SESC plans and taking a look at common best management practices or BMPs and their installation and maintenance issues. Finally, module three will cover inspections, permitting and enforcement, and in specific, why we do inspections and what can be done for permitting and enforcement. If you have questions and you are in a live event, we will have a discussion period between the modules where you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you and you can ask a question or you can simply type a question in the comments area and we'll answer it there. Let's get started with module one, a review of SESC manual materials related to stormwater runoff and soil erosion and sedimentation control. Soil erosion and sedimentation controls are important because according to Erosion Control Magazine, an estimated 80 million tons of sediment is discharged annually from construction sites. Drain maintenance is authorized at $5,000 per mile per year in Michigan based on the Michigan Drain Code. An estimated dredging cost to the state of Michigan and local governments is $3.9 million per year with an additional $9.3 million per year contributed from federal sources, according to the Michigan Sea Grant Program. Remember, it's better for the environment and most cost effective to prevent discharges from happening than it is to fix one. Let's take a look at a couple of sites where Eagle took enforcement action for releases of sediment to waters of the state. The first is a well-known Southwest Michigan University. Let's see what happened there. We're following a developing story surrounding a construction site at Western Michigan University. A State Department says that it found several deficiencies involving that project when sediment unlawfully entered Asylum Lake. These images just into our newsroom tonight show what happened last week when several inches of rain fell in the Kalamazoo area. That storm runoff went into Asylum Lake. The State Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy is blaming these murky waters on the ongoing construction at Business Technology and Research Park 2. The state agency says the construction team did not have proper erosion control measures. It also says WMU lacked the proper permit coverage for two months. The EGLE is now ordering Western to address these issues or be fined. The university says it's already doing so and plans on filing the necessary paperwork. Wow, so that was some seriously sediment-laden water that was discharged into a wetland in a lake. These types of discharges destroy habitats and can carry excess nutrients and other pollutants to destroy water quality. Now let's take a look at some uh, on-site Eagle video footage from a place in Eaton County where Eagle completed enforcement proceedings. So did you see any SESC measures installed? Do you think the measures were sufficient to control the erosion or sediment migration? The site could have done several things to control soil erosion, such as staging rather than exposing all that soil. The project could have been done in phases, stabilizing smaller areas when they were to final grade, or the site could have installed several different BMPs in succession to control the movement of sedimentation. 
Remember, it's always best to reduce or eliminate erosion rather than trying to control the sedimentation. When Eagle takes enforcement, it can be very costly. Let's see how that Eaton County site fared in enforcement. This is a news release regarding the Eaton County site. Eagle gave the site several chances to return to compliance, but ultimately took action to protect the natural resources in the area. The court ordered the company to pay a $243,500 fine, take actions to fully stabilize the site, and pay the course cost, the court costs of $102,408.75. That's a total of $345,908.75, not to mention what it will cost to fully stabilize the site. This graph shows the effects of turbidity on fish. Notice with only a few hours of exposure to low turbidity, fish show signs of stress. With prolonged exposure to turbidity at high rates, it causes death. The soil erosion processes of rainwater are defined as the following. Sheet erosion, which removes a uniform thin layer of soil. Rill erosion, which is when the rain concentrates and pass through the topsoil. And gully, which is a formation of deep incised channels. Rilling gully are the most obvious on a site. However, sheet erosion generally results in a greater loss of soil. Preventing soil erosion is important because prevention is often less expensive and less time consuming than performing restoration. Eagle recommends leaving as much vegetation in place as possible and staging the project to reduce the amount of exposed soil areas. Eagle acknowledges that many times the inspectors don't have a say in the staging, but you do have the responsibility to notify the site responsible party or permittee of the effectiveness of the SESC plan and measures. Vegetation is of utmost importance because roots stabilize and bind soil to prevent erosion. Vegetation also slows runoff, filters out sediment, and shields soil from raindrop impact. If vegetation is properly removed and staged, it can even reduce the cost of stabilizing since you could reuse it. Staging or phasing help prevent or reduce erosion by minimizing the area of disturbance. In layman's terms, only the active construction area has bare soil and all other areas are still vegetated or stabilized. Though this is not widely used, it is highly recommended, especially in areas that are adjacent to wetlands, lakes, or streams. One of the best erosion control measures is to minimize the disturbance as much as possible. This is not always possible, but if you can phase or stage the project and minimize disturbance, it greatly reduces the erosion potential of a site. Buffer strips can assist in protecting sensitive areas. Well-established natural vegetation can protect wetlands and bodies of water from sediment releases by slowing stormwater flow and filtering out sediment. Reduce erosion, Stormwater flows need to be slowed down. Surface roughening makes the slope bumpy and therefore slows the runoff as it proceeds downhill. Think of it like raindrops running over speed bumps. It can be easily accomplished by driving a dozer or other tracked vehicle perpendicular to the slope. Roughening also produces a soil surface more suitable for the growth of vegetation because it will hold the seed and retain moisture. Scarification is similar but it is generally performed with a drag or a cultivator pulled across the slope, as in the bottom photo here. The process, again, forms a speed bump for the runoff to slow down as it makes its way down the slope. Know your seeding windows. Seed planting windows vary greatly across our state. It is important to know the seeding windows for your project area to give yourself the best possible opportunity to get that vegetation established. We have to this point discussed why to control soil erosion and sedimentation, and some practices that can aid in the reduction of erosion. Now let's review some of the more common best management practices used for SESC. All of the following items should be reviewed during each site inspection. Products such as mulch blankets or turf reinforcement mats protect the soils and live seed from erosion and provide an environment to promote germination and growth of vegetation. Check dams are generally constructed of rock and are often installed in a series. A check dam's primary purpose is to slow the water velocity in areas of concentrated flow. 
They can also act as sedimentation controls if the water is slowed sufficiently to allow sediment to deposit on the upslope side of the dam. Versions are used to route water around the work site, which can reduce erosion during construction and promote work in the dry. Dust control should be implemented to reduce wind erosion across bare soils. Sites should consider leaving windbreaks of existing trees around the site, or in cases where dusty, dry condition exists, should implement a wetting program to keep the soil moist. Silt fence is one of the most commonly used BMPs, and unfortunately, it is the most often misused and neglected. Silt fence should be installed in areas of sheet flow, never in concentrated flow. It should be installed along horizontal contours, trenched six inches in, and backfilled on either side. It is intended to remove sediment out of suspension by slowing the water as it passes through it. Turbidity curtains isolate the worksite. These, like all SESC measures, must be installed properly to function correctly. Coffer dams are often used on bridge replacements. They also isolate the worksite and protect the work area from water flow. A gravel access road can help reduce sediment tracked offsite during construction. Track out should also be managed with the implementation of a street sweeping program. Pay attention to the rock size. Too small a rock gets caught in the tires of the vehicles. And the rock will likely need new layers as the project progresses. Once you see that the rock is clogged with soil or mud on top, it's time for a new layer. The access road should be inspected as part of the site inspection, and it should be noted if the rock is becoming clogged with mud or soil. Inlet protection comes in a variety of products, depending on the location and configuration of the inlets. These products should be selected using the size, location, configuration, and manufacturer specification. Because storm drains often directly discharge to a stream or river, they should always be protected during construction. If you don't want your kids swimming in it, shouldn't be leaving your site. All inlet protection devices need constant maintenance and should be checked during each inspection. Sedimentation basins are used to trap sand and large silt sized particles during construction. Stormwater basins are designed to capture clean stormwater and release it after a period of time. These are not designed to handle large amounts of sediment from construction sites. There are two types of basins. The first is a detention basin. These are designed to hold the water for a period of time and then release it once it reaches a certain level. Think of getting trouble in school and having to go to detention. You're eventually released. So these have an outlet where the water is eventually released. Then there are retention basins. This is where the water is fully retained within the basin and either evaporates or infiltrates the ground because there is no outlet. So think of retaining water. It won't leave your body unless you take it out of the ordinary steps to get rid of it. If converting a sedimentation basin to a stormwater basin, the accumulated sediment should be cleaned out after construction activities have ceased. Soil texture will be covered more in depth in module two. Soils are an important property to consider when you're approving and designing SCSC plans. Sand is bigger in particle size and heavier, so it drops out of suspension faster and easier. In contrast, silts have the consistency of flour and will stay in suspension longer. Clays stick to each other and roll well in your hands when it's wet. They have the smallest particle size. And though difficult to erode, once in suspension, clays are not easily removed. In general, on this chart, as you go down and to the right, soils become more erodible. We must also pay attention to the soil groups when planning SESC measures. Soil group A has high infiltration and low runoff potential. These are sands and gravels. Group B has moderate infiltration and runoff. These include sandy loams, loams, silty loams. Group C has low infiltration and increased runoff. These are clay loams. And finally, group D, which has slow infiltration and high runoff, are clays. Part 91 is all about keeping your dirt on your site and out of the waters of the state and off adjacent properties. Part 31 is all about protecting the waters of the state from injurious materials. Part 31 also contains permit by rule. That's where stormwater permits are required from any construction activity that disturbs one or more acres of land 
and has a point source discharge to surface waters of the state. A point source is defined as a discharge that is released to waters of the state by a discernible, confined, and discrete conveyance, including any of the following from which wastewater is or may be discharged. A pipe, a ditch, a channel, a conduit. Point source also includes any runoff as a result of grading, regardless of it is sheet flow or concentrated flow. Under permit by rule, stormwater coverage from Eagle is considered automatic for the sites that are one to five acres, as long as the owner has part 91 coverage. Sites five acres or more must apply for a notice of coverage from Eagle. Part 31 is enforced by Eagle. CEAs and APAs do not regulate or enforce part word 31, but the person responsible for the site must comply with the requirements. Permits must be issued in the landowner's name. A designated agent can apply for the landowner, but the permit must be issued to the landowner. The state requires that a permit issued for disturbances equal to or greater than one acre that are within 500 feet of a lake or stream. A lake is considered one acre of open surface water and a stream has a definite bed and banks with visible evidence of continued occurrence of water. An agency may have an ordinance that is more restrictive than state requirement. So if the area is over one acre in size, you have to have a permit. If the site is five acres or more with a discharge to surface waters, it also must apply for a notice of coverage from Eagle via My Waters. So again, the permit must be issued to the landowner or easement holder. The permit requires that approved SESC plans be available on site and that the plans are maintained to reflect any necessary changes. After a Part 91 permit is issued to a landowner, they automatically have Eagle stormwater coverage for construction sites that disturb one to five acres under permit by rule. If a site exceeds five acres, the permittee must also file a notice of coverage via My Waters with Eagle. Permit by rule was developed under the authority of part 31 for any construction activity that disturbs one or more acres and has a point source discharge to surface waters of the state. Part 91 inspections are required by the county enforcing agency, CEA, municipal enforcing agency, MEA, or the approved public agency, APA, but also are required by the permittee under permit by rule. Inspections must be conducted by a certified stormwater operator and permit by rule requires weekly inspections and inspections within 24 hours of storm event. Part 91 is focused on keeping soil on the site and inspections are required until the site is permanently stabilized. The primary goal of Part 31 is to protect and conserve the waters of the state. All construction sites must have all required permits before earth movement begins. The state has minimum required elements that must be on all SESC permit applications and all issued SESC permits. The state prescribed SESC application elements are as follows. Applicant with contact information, a detailed location for the earth change, the type, description, and size of the proposed earth change, so it's type, description, and size. It also has to have the name and distance to the nearest surface water, and the project start and end dates. Also, an SESC plan needs to be submitted and the developer of the plan with contact information should be included. Parties responsible for the earth change, including the name of the landowner and the name of the individual on-site responsible party for the earth change and their contact information. A performance deposit, if applicable, and a signature from the landowner or designated agent certifying that the work will be completed in accordance with Part 91 Soil Erosion and Sedimentation Control of the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act, 1994 PA 451 as amended, applicable local ordinances, and the documents accompanying the application. Permits also must contain prescribed elements, such as the permittee and their address, the permit number, the issued date, the expiration date, the on-site responsible person, including their name, company, and telephone number, a description of the permitted activity, the project location, permit conditions, the permitting agents, 
signature and telephone number, general conditions of the permit, and any specific conditions prescribed by the CEA or MEA. There are 13 elements required to be included in all SESC plans. We will go over each of them in more detail in module two, but here's a quick refresher of the list. A map to scale of less than 200 feet to one inch, a legal description of the location, a site location sketch, the proximity to water, predominant land features, contour and avoids or slope description, soil type, limits of earth change, any drainage or dewatering activities, the timing and sequence for the earth change, the description, location, and installation details for all temporary SESC measures, the description, location, and installation details for all permanent SESC measures, and a maintenance program for permanent SESC measures, including the party responsible for the maintenance. We will also go over this in more detail in module two, but in general, plans should be reviewed before issuing permits to ensure the plan complies with all part 91 requirements, accurately depicts the on-site conditions, and the prescribed control measures will be adequate to effectively control erosion and off-site sedimentation. The person reviewing the appro and approving the plans must have a valid plan review and design level certification, not inspector only, from EGLE. The various agencies' roles and responsibilities are as follows. First, County Enforcing Agency, CEA, which are required to implement Part 91 as written or to implement an ordinance or resolution, which may be more restrictive. Next is a Municipal Enforcing Agency, or MEA, like a city, village, or township, which may elect to implement Part 91 through an ordinance, which may be more restrictive than Part 91. The last agency is the Authorized Public Agency, or APA which is a state or local government unit. These must have approved procedures through EGLE and they do not issue permits, but they are required to have SESC plans that meet all requirements of Part 91 for non-routine construction projects. EGLE is responsible to provide program oversight and assistance to all the enforcing agencies and to review ordinances and procedures. Inspections are an important component for running a successful SESC program or for managing a successful project or site. All projects must be inspected by a trained individual. They should have a working knowledge of SESC techniques, plan requirements, permit conditions, and be able to recognize when measures are not effective. Permit by rule inspections are required weekly and within 24 hours of a brain event, resulting in a discharge from the site. We will go over this more in module three. Part 91 agency inspections should be performed often enough to ensure compliance with their SESC plan, SESC permit, or approved procedures in the case of APAs. We have now completed module one portion of the virtual comprehensive SESC plan review and design refresher course. Thank you for your attention and your participation. All right, I have a few follow-up polling questions. I think Jake is going to chime in here as well once I get these up. So I'll launch the first one. All right, you should be seeing it on your screen. Which agency, which agency type is required by statute to administer and enforce Part 91? Uh, is it an authorized public agency, county enforcing agency, municipal enforcing agency, or uh, Michigan Department of Natural Resources? So I'll give you a couple seconds. Please take a minute. Uh, pick the answer you think answers the question best. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it out. Going once, going twice, and I'm going to share the results. All right, looks like 50, 52% uh, is the highest. Yeah, go ahead, Jake. Yep, I was just going to say, looks like the majority, 52%, got the correct answer. And the correct answer there is the county enforcing agency. So, yep. All right, I will launch the next one.
Right. Who are Part 91 permits issued to? The applicant for the permit, the site contractor, landowner, easement holder, or whoever the agency deems worthy. All right, so take a couple more seconds here. We'll go ahead and close this out. Looks like most of you have voted. And here are the results. All right, even more people got that one correct. 75% uh, got the right answer. It is uh, part 91 permits are always issued to a landowner or easement holder. So it's not the applicant for the permit or a contractor. It has to be the landowner or easement holder. All right, and I will then move on to the next and final one for this uh, section. All right, which of the following is not a requirement for site plans under Rule 1703? Scaled map, predominant land features, location of on-site utilities, uh, or location of temporary SESC measures. Go ahead and take a vote on the one you think matches best. And I'll go ahead and close the poll. And there are the results. All right. An even bigger majority got that one correct. So that is the correct answer. 85% had location of on site utilities. They do not need to be a part of site plans under Rule 1703. So I will uh, take it over and hit on some important points here. Uh, some of them that the video talked about uh, and then just kind of add on some of the stuff from my experience out in the field um, of the material that I, I think is kind of important to cover. So as the video mentioned, uh, vegetation is one of the most important physical factors influencing soil erosion on sites. Um, the reason is it, it shields soil from rain impact, so you're not going to have as much soil coming loose during rain events if it's vegetated. Uh, vegetation's roots bind the soil together, so it's less likely to flow off during rain events. Um, the vegetation will actually help the site absorb water better, so there's less stormwater running off site, um, which means less of a headache for people trying to manage stormwater on the site. And it's usually the cheapest and most effective way to stabilize sites. Um, to come through and revegetate that. And related to that, something that they discussed in the video is scheduling and, and phasing. Um, it's really important to have a plan um, to schedule or phase, especially for larger construction sites when you're going into it. Uh, some of the biggest problem sites I've seen uh, working for Eagle um, are sites where you had large construction sites, like 20 acre sites that decided that they wanted to open up the entire site even though they were only working in a portion of the site. Um, it's, it's important that you only open the section of the site that you're working in if possible. Um, that just allows less of the site to be um, open and not vegetated, which means it's just less of a headache that you have to worry about. So minimizing those, those bare areas and trying to revegetate areas where you've completed work is really important. Um, and in order to do that, you should set a schedule or phase in a plan going into it. Another thing they talked about is silt vents. Um, like they mentioned in the video, it's definitely the most commonly used, but also the most commonly misused uh, soil erosion and, and sedimentation control uh, that we see on sites. Uh, a lot of times it's used when it doesn't even need to be used. That's another thing to take into consideration. Um, it doesn't need to be used if there's no need for it. So if you have a site that's completely flat and stormwater is not going to run off, um, you don't need to put up silt fence just because it looks pretty. We do see that a lot of times that people want to use it for perimeter control or that maybe an agency gets nervous because they don't see a soil erosion measure on a, on a plan. But, you know, there are times where it may not call for it. But when it is being used, you need to make sure that it's not being used in concentrated flow areas. It should be used only to control sheet flow. Um, oftentimes we'll see people using one or two or three rows of silt fence in concentrated flow areas, and, and that's not what it's built for, um, and you're just going to lead to bigger problems. 
Um, with that being said, uh, you also don't want to, uh, you know, use it like in the pretty much in the wrong area. <laughs> you should you should be using high velocity uh, measures in in high velocity and uh, flow area. So just don't use your your silt fence. Um, maintenance is also really really important with silt fence. A lot of times we'll get to sites and see that silt fence or sediment is built up on the silt fence over halfway full. Uh, when silt fence and sediment builds up on it, um, when it's about a third to a half full up on the silt fence, uh, there should be maintenance going on to clear that sediment away or else you're asking for, for trouble uh, the next time you have a rain or storm event. Agency inspections are uh, another thing we, we touched on briefly in that video and I think they're really important. Um, it's it's important that agencies are doing their inspections, but not only that, you need to make sure you're documenting those inspections. A lot of times when Eagle staff go out to uh, audit our agencies, they'll note that they're going out and doing inspections. And then when we ask for verification or, or documentation that they've done them, we won't see anything. They won't make any record. Um, in order for us to know that you guys are doing the inspections that you're required to do, you need to make sure you're documenting them properly. With that, you need to make sure you're doing those inspections at a proper frequency too. Um, we'll see every once in a while that an agency will get out to a site um, for a pre-inspection um, when they're applying for the permit and then they won't go back out again until the permit's being closed out. Well, if that's the case, you're gonna have no idea what's going on or what the site conditions are like during the active construction. So it's really important that you get out and do those inspections. Um, at all really three phases um, at least one inspection in the beginning to kind of see the layout of the site one you know during an active construction period so you know what's going on and, and what the site looks like and then a close out inspection to see if it's properly stabilized and the permit's able to be closed out um, if the agency for some reason is having trouble uh, meeting those requirements or, or can't get out to all those inspections uh, you need to look into maybe developing a, a site matrix or inspection matrix that will allow you to prioritize the sites to get out to. And lastly, uh, we'll discuss 1703 requirements just briefly. Um, they mentioned all 13 of the rule 1703 requirements in the video there, and they're gonna get into more detail in module two, um, but just make sure that the plans include the 1703 requirements. Um, a lot of times that's something that is missed on sites. Um, when we go out there, you know, there's there's often multiple elements not on the site plan. So it's important to make sure that you have all those 1703 requirements. They're there for a reason. They give inspectors um, and a good idea of what's going on on site. So it's an important thing to have. And we will take some questions now. And then after the questions, uh, Mike Kraut will take you into module two. Thanks, Jake, for your presentation. Um, we actually received one question. Um, I did go ahead and answer it, but I think it would be nice if we could elaborate on it a little bit. Um, the question was if we could provide an example where an ordinance would be more restrictive than Part 91. So I thought maybe you could talk about that topic a little bit. Yeah, um, a lot of times where we see an ordinance more restrictive than Part 91, um, I would say it involves wetlands a lot of times. So part 91 will regulate uh, lakes and streams. So permits um, are issued to construction sites that are within 500 feet of a lake or a stream. But we'll see a lot of counties uh, that wanna be more restrictive um, or municipalities and they'll add wetlands. That's one of the more common ones. Um, we'll also see agencies that may add things like sites that are on a certain slope um, need to get a permit or a certain soil type. So like clay soil sites where clay is, is predominantly the, the soil type, they'll have to get a permit. Um, those are kind of the areas where we usually see a little bit more restrictive, um, I guess, need to apply for a permit. Um, and then ordinances can also be a little bit more restrictive than part 91 for certain elements like um, compliance and enforcement. So certain agencies might add things like staff work orders, um, ticket writing authority and, and measures like that to allow them to have a little bit more compliance and enforcement than, than part 91 would allow. 
I think that's it. If that's the only yeah. question, and I am going to kick it over to Mike Kraut to get us going with module two. Thanks, Jake. Hello everyone, Mike Kraut from Bay County area, the Bay City area district. I uh, cover 12 uh, counties in that area, ranging from Iosco, Ogama, all the way to Huron and Sanilac County, and then Bay and Saginaw in between. Uh, we'll kick it over to module two, and then we'll go through the poll questions, and I'll touch on, on those poll questions in depth a little bit more as we go. And then we'll take your answer or your questions as they come up. So Ryan. This is the comprehensive SCSE plan review and design refresher course, module two. In this module, we will be looking more in depth at the plan review and design component of the refresher course. This will include identifying some of the more common issues and problems encountered during the plan review and design portion of the permitting process. We're going to begin by examining the 13 minimum required elements of an SCSE plan. The expectation is that all plans will have each of these elements. When EGLE performs a program review, we look for every item on every SCSE plan we review and often find errors or omissions. We're going to break them down and discuss why each element is important. The first three are obvious, a site location map, legal description, which identifies property boundaries and proof of ownership and can include the parcel number, and a site location sketch. This can be as simple as an image printed from Google Earth and should have a town, roads, or highways indicated so that basically at a glance it will tell you roughly where in the county or township the project is located and it doesn't need to be to scale. The proximity of the project. The plan review designer may create this in a narrative format or it may be indicated on a scaled map. Whether the nearest lake or stream is a hundred feet away or a half mile away, this is important information to have to determine the characteristics of the watershed and where runoff will flow. If earthwork is over an acre in size or is taking place within 500 feet of a lake or stream, an SCSE permit is required. Predominant land features. What land features are currently there? And what will change? Examples of predominant land features are roads, trees, farms, houses, and water bodies. Slope information. This should include pre and post construction conditions. This tells us how much grade will change or how much cut and fill activities will be occurring at the site. It also identifies where flow patterns may change from sheet flow to concentrated flow. This may be indicated by contour lines, or the information can be included in a written format or using arrows. Now we're going to spend some time on soil information. The next several slides will discuss why it is important. The soil information can be written on the plan, photocopied from a page in a county soil survey, or provided with soil borings. Some SCSE agencies require the soil information on the permit application. Is it clay, silt, or sand? And why is that important? In general, sand will allow high amounts of water to infiltrate and will settle out quickly. Sand also has low erodibility and low runoff. Silt soils are easily eroded or highly erosive. They have a moderate potential for runoff because it isn't easy for the water to soak through the smaller particles. Once suspended in water, silt particles may flow quite a distance as they aren't heavy enough to fall out. Clay soils are problematic for soil erosion and sedimentation control. They have a high runoff potential and low infiltration rates. It is difficult for the water to pass through these tiny particles. Clays have a moderate potential for erodibility. Once in suspension, the clay particles do not settle out and can be carried great distances. The implementation of SCSE measures must be greatly contemplated on sites with clay soils. Clay soils are soil groups C and D. Silt soils are group B. And sand is group A. We'll discuss these groups in more detail. 
Soil texture refers to the proportion of sand, silt, and clay-sized particles that make up the mineral fraction of soil. Understanding the soil texture is an important part of SCSE, allowing the plan designer to appropriately select the SCSE measures for the area by indicating which areas are prone to erosion. Sand is bigger in particle size and heavier, so it drops out of suspension easier and faster. Silts have the consistency of flour and will stay in suspension longer. Clays stick to each other and our hands if we touch it and has the smallest particle size. Loam is a mixture of clay, silt, and sand. We referenced settlement rates earlier. As you can see on this slide, sand has a high infiltration rate and low runoff and is in hydrologic group A. Sand settles out quickly. Clays are in hydrologic groups C and D. They have a low infiltration rate and high runoff potential. USDA's Web Soil Survey is a great resource for information about the soils located on your site. Let's look at how to use the Web Soil Survey in this brief tutorial. So an easy way to find out what kind of soils you have on your site is to use the USDA Soil Survey. It can be found on the web by simply going to a browser, typing in USDA Soil Survey, and searching. You want to make sure you're getting on the right uh, site, so make sure it says websoilsurvey.nrcs.usda.gov, and that's the one you want. Once this page opens up, you really only have to hit start, WSS, and the best way I think to find uh, your location is by typing in the address. If you have an address, and hitting enter. So the program takes us to our little address spot there. Next, you need to select your area of interest. Uh, you can do it by a rectangle or by drawing a polygon. I'm going simple with just a little rectangle. This is just telling me there's multiple soil surveys in my area of interest, which is okay with me. I wanna to go to my soil map so I can see what my soil types are. And there they are. So let's say we want to um, do some clearing and developing here along McClure Road. So uh, along McClure, it looks like on both sides of the road, we have BNF for our soil type. So I'm gonna come over to the left-hand side of the screen here Scroll down and find my BNF. It looks like we've got Boyer Loamy Sand there. It's got 25 to 50% slope. It's a pretty slopey site. Uh, we either have to take that into consideration when we're designing or if we've got uh, the opportunity to uh, maybe move somewhere else or look for an area of less slope. That would be, that would be a nice. Um, so we've got a little bit of a slope. Let's go ahead and click on Boyer Loamy Sand there. And look, it gives me a lot of other information. Um, so let me see what else have we got here. Uh, back slope, slide slope, riser. Uh, we've got, it says that our slope is 25 to 50%, right? We knew that. Uh, drainage class is well drained, runoff class is medium. Uh, we've got hydrologic soil group A, which, uh, would say that it probably has pretty decent uh, infiltration, right? Although the slope may be affecting that, because it's quite a slope. All right. So with that, we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at our Soil Data Explorer. And then we'll go over to Soil Reports there. We'll look over here on the left-hand side, we find soil erosion. So let's see, uh, rust two related attributes, click on that. And then I'm gonna say view soil report. All right, when I scroll to the bottom here, I have my soil report. So I'm in my Washtenaw County. I'm in my BNF, Boyer Loamy Sand, 25 to 50% slope. It says I got a slope length of 98 feet. I'm in my hydrologic 
uh, soil group of A. Um, I can use my K factor for calculations, but instead I'm going to go to a website that uh, does the calculations for me. So let me open up a new tab. Go ahead and type in Russell MSU. And there it is. Again, I want to make sure I'm going to the website. So this is msu.edu. And this site will help you calculate your erosion rates. So we'll go down to calculate erosion. We've got a construction site, so I'm going to select that. We're in Washtenaw County. There that is. Click Next. All right, you can put your site ID on here if you want to. Um, I'm not going to fill that in, but I am going to say, okay, we've got, we're going to try and stick to our 25% slope. I don't really want to be building on the 50%. And uh, our slope, uh, our length of the slope was uh, 98 feet, we said. Well, the closest I got is 100, so I'm going to select that. We've got my Boyer BNF right here. And let's say we're going to clear two acres. All right, and down below, we're just going to say, yeah, we're not going to put anything on it for now. We'll take our chances, right? How bad can it be? Hit continue. And it calculated our tolerable or our, our calculated soil loss for us. So that's uh, in acres or tons per acre per year. <clears throat> Looks like we're at 78.03 tons per acre per year, which is unacceptable. So it's showing us in red. And then it's got the asterisk says, you know, the erosion from this plate appears to be higher than the tolerable soil loss. Well, yeah, because the tolerable soil loss is four tons per acre per year. So we got to try and get below that. So let's go on back. We're going to have to add something to it here. So let's see. Straw. We've got a land slope of 25. But see, the run can only be 75. So that's not going to work for us. Well, it doesn't look like we can put straw down. Okay, the next one here is crust stone. Let's see. Yep, we got, we can do 21 to 23 inch slopes, or percent slopes, and we can go up to 100 feet. So let's try that. Throw a little stone on there. And looky there. Our uh, calculated soil loss is nicely, just barely, <laughs> below the tolerated soil loss. So that would be acceptable. Let's try a different type of cover and see. Let's see what the wood chips do. We got a wood chips here, yeah. So there's yeah, 21 to 33 percent slope, 100 foot length. Let's try that. Let's see what we get here. Wow. Yeah, now we're doing real good. So our tolerable soil loss is four tons per acre per year. Didn't change, right? But our calculated soil loss now is only 1.56 tons per acre per year. So for the potential soil loss total is still underneath the tolerable soil loss. So that's great. Uh, and hey, wood chips are probably cheaper too. All right, so uh, there's your tutorial on uh, how to do the um, Russell equation and, and how to use the web soil survey. Hope you learned something out of it and uh, hope you get a chance to use these tools to help you with your soil erosion and sedimentation control. Finally, during our discussion of soils, rain ball can affect erodibility and runoff. This slide displays inches of rain for a 24-hour rainfall event based on rainfall frequencies, location zones, and the probability of an event occurring each year. A county in zone 6, for example, will have how many inches of rain in a two-year event? The answer is 2.27 inches. Eagle recommends that SCSE measures are designed to withstand a 10-year rainfall event. Moving on to our next element required by Rule 1703, limits of earth's change. This one is commonly omitted. The area of disturbance needs to be defined and will not be assumed. The plan reviewer should undoubtedly know what the limit is. It is important to clearly define where permitted activity will start and stop. This ensures that work is being conducted only in the approved and permitted area and that neighboring properties or water bodies will be protected. Dewatering and drainage. Will there be dewatering on site? Where will the dewatering bag be placed? The SCSE plans should not be approved unless the answers are known to these questions. Water needs to be filtered so that leaving the site it is not sediment laden. 
The timing and sequencing can be demonstrated using start and end dates for less complicated projects or a timeline that exhibits each phase or stage of the project for larger projects. Pay particular attention to project start and end dates. Starting to excavate in late November may be a questionable decision as it is not practical to assume any vegetation would establish until late spring. Completing work in stages dramatically reduces the potential for erosion. The timing and sequence should include seeding windows. Seed planting windows vary greatly across the state. It is important to know the seeding window for your project area to give yourself the best opportunity to get vegetation established. This project was finished in the fall with seeding planned for the spring. What is going to happen during fall rain, winter melting runoff events, and early spring precipitation? Seed the ground early or use appropriate winter SCSC measures. What temporary control measures will be beneficial to use on site? What are installation details and removal dates? Are the proposed measures and locations appropriate? For example, is silt fence placed in a concentrated flow area? Silt fence should be installed at the base of slopes adjacent to sensitive or critical areas and parallel to flow. Are there enough measures given the size of the project, complexity of the site, soil types, and proximity to critical or sensitive areas to sufficiently manage runoff? These are questions that need to be considered. This is an eight acre site with steep cut slopes and no plans for seeding or blanketing until the end of the project. Several discharges were documented to the list. Should this plan have been approved in the first place? Both the SCSC agency and the permittee received violation notices. The plans were revised and the site was temporarily stabilized with seed and blankets. No further discharges from the site occurred. Permanent SCSC measures. The designer wants to consider the installation dates and methods. Does the location of the proposed permanent measures seem appropriate? Maintenance programs. A maintenance program for single family home projects can be as simple as stating in writing that the homeowner will be responsible for maintaining vegetation on site. But what about sites with check dams? How will those be maintained? How about a sediment basin that is converted to a stormwater pond? Who will clean it? The developer? Or is it turned over to the homeowner association? This is important information to know when creating an SCSC plan. Now that you are familiar with the 13 required elements of a SCSC plan, let's go over what is commonly missed and common mistakes. The first step in designing a good plan is conducting a thorough review of the existing site conditions. Are there steep slopes? Are there any critical or sensitive areas adjacent to the work site? If there is a water body, are there any wetlands or adjacent areas that should be avoided? Careful thought should be put into every SCSC plan. This will enable the project to move forward smoothly and remain in compliance. Anytime a construction project is immediately adjacent to sensitive areas like a stream or lake, plans should also address critical areas such as steep slopes. Here is a portion of a schedule. It is clear both in time and space how this project will progress. Looking at these slides, what of importance do you notice? Is it clear when SCSC measures should be installed? Silt fence should be installed before earthwork starts and removed when the area is stable prior to submitting a notice of termination. This is from a large construction site in South Haven, Michigan during a light rain. You can see the sand particles settling out behind the straw barrier. The clay sized particles are passing over the straw barrier through a small sediment basin, through a brush barrier, through three layers of silt fence, and discharging into the Black River. This site is in Van Buren County and had sandy clay soils. Look at the sand that settled out first in front of the straw bales. However, you will notice the clay continued to discharge despite several SCSE measures in place. There are a lot of SCSE measures in place at this site, but the soil type on site makes it difficult to control sediment from leaving the site during rain or snow melt. This is the outlet to the Black River from the previous picture, and there is a discharge taking place. A detailed staging plan or the use of PAMs are tools that may have prevented sediment from discharging to the river. Remember that it is important to know the soil type, slope, and proximity to a water body. In areas of sheet flow, silt fence allows sediment to drop out and water slowly infiltrate through the woven geotextile fabric. The fence is not effective in concentrated flow areas. What may have been a good alternative here? 
perhaps an appropriately sized and properly installed check dam. Jute is not a suitable substitute for silt fence. Sadly, these are photos taken on actual project sites. Clearly, the silt fence is not preventing sedimentation from occurring. This is a picture of deposition at the bottom of a hill. The erosion controls on site must not have been very good because a lot of sediment has deposited enough that the silt fence was overwhelmed in several areas. The silt fence in the foreground looks good. What about the silt fence in the background? This technique for starting a course of silt fence is not recommended. There are many benefits to using temporary check dams. Two of them are that they are reusable and safer for traffic. The top diagram shows the elevation from the toe of the upper dam to the top of the overflow of the downstream dam. The bottom diagram is for a manufactured check dam. The spacing and need to bring the dam all the way to the side of the slope are the same. This check dam is not properly constructed. It is decreasing the channel's ability to hold water and instead is acting like a series of step pools. At this check dam, the stone is too small. The sides of the channel are not covered with stone. It should be lower in the middle. The flow is coming towards us. It's difficult to see, but there's some side cutting. Look at the middle check dam. The sides were either not brought up enough or it was not centered. This series of dams have good spacing, but the stones should be carried up the side slopes more. The middle should be lower to allow water to cascade down the rock. Here, soil erosion has taken place. The sediment has been deposited before the check dam, before the dam slowed the water, which caused the soil to drop out. You never know what you will see when you are doing inspections. There is no one size fits all when it comes to inlet protection. The effectiveness varies depending on soil types and is not highly effective with fine silts and clays. Pre-manufactured devices are preferable. Placing rolled fabric under grates is never recommended. A few counties require the use of silt sacks instead of fabric drops. We don't prefer fabric drops either because of the maintenance issue. However, if the wrap were over the grate rather than underneath, you could at least remove the sediment without dropping it into the inlet. The inlet protection requires maintenance in this photo. It is important to not rely solely on inlet protection for your site. Phasing and staging can reduce erosion from occurring and therefore reduce sedimentation and the need for maintenance. Ensure that there is a plan in place to remove the inlet protection so that the material does not fall in when the grate is lifted. Fabrics have no capacity for water and clay seals them off and may cause flooding. This is not the proper way to address a flooding issue. Poking a hole in the fabric, although tempting, will simply allow the sediment to discharge into the drain. Here's a diagram of a gravel inlet filter constructed in the middle of a yard. Hardware cloth is wrapped around gravel, keeping it in place and protecting the inlets. Have you seen this at a construction site or had to deal with a neighbor's complaint? Track out of sediment can trigger many complaints. A rock access or street sweeping are typically required to address this issue. Next, we're going to discuss turbidity curtains. Keep in mind that if you are using a turbidity curtain, you will likely need a Part 301 303 permit from Eagle. The turbidity curtain is designed to isolate the work area. Now we are going to discuss rolled erosion control products. Make sure the blanket type specified on plants matches its designated use. You need to check the rating for longevity, slope, and velocity. Is the material being used straw or coconut fiber, and is it biodegradable? Make sure the product specified is appropriate for the site condition. Here's an actual installation. They did a great job. Here they ran along the top and trenched that in, then rolled down the slope along the channel. Here we see turf reinforcement mat and temporary check dams. This is a permanent control measure for vegetative growth. Once grass is established, it is comparable to 36 inches of riprap. This example of a blanket failure demonstrates how important it is to choose the right product and install it properly. The amount of money spent to remove the existing blanket, fill in the eroded area, reseed and re-blanket with new product is quite costly. In areas where blankets won't work, consider bonded fiber matrix. This is a blend of mulch tackifier and sometimes fertilizer. It's rated the same as blanket and no anchoring is required. 
it is applied the same as hydroseeding. It may work better in areas not feasible for blankets or steep slopes. As we mentioned earlier, dewatering needs to be addressed with appropriate best management practices. Do not let sediment laden water leave your site during dewatering activities. Plan review and design final thoughts. Plan the development to fit the natural site topography, vegetation, waterways, and soils. Stage the project. Expose the least amount of soil for the least amount of time. Focus on preventing erosion whenever possible. Do not rely on one measure to protect the entire site. Finally, operate a thorough inspection and maintenance program. This ends Module 2. All right, so that was module two. And again, I have three more polling questions for you here. So the first one here, I'm gonna launch. You should be seeing a pop up here. All right, what is one of the best ways to save money, time, materials after a project has started? Please take a minute to complete that poll. And uh, we'll close it here in a second. And your options are, I'll clear off the whole area at the beginning, eliminate control measures that you don't need. I'm actually having trouble reading these. Properly install, maintain control measures, fix control measures once a month. So go ahead and close that out. Show you the results. All right. Pretty much correct. Uh, the first part, uh, by clearing out the whole area, the beginning of the project causes you a lot of extra work. You usually have to control that whole area the whole time instead of staging it. Um, eliminating control measures that you don't think are needed uh, is not a good choice, um, but properly maintaining and, con and control and inst installation and maintaining those control measures are the best. Um, it's going to save you a lot of time, money, extra visits to do it right the first time and to put them in the right spot the first time. Um, and not only in installing them, but maintaining them as it goes along, sort of like the changing oil in your car. If you don't change oil in your car, you're gonna have a lot of really expensive uh, fix, fixes down the road. So, and then fix control measure once a month uh, is not correct because of rain events and then you gotta have proper maintenance on the project. So uh, very good on the 95% question. All right. So the next question, launching now, and it's distributing the poll. Okay, so should be seeing it up on your screen. All right. What is one of the best things that can be done to save money, time, material for a new project? Uh, start the project before you get your permits, visit the site, a higher surveyor and start with a good site specific plan. Take a minute to choose the best answer and I'll go ahead and close it out. And share the results. Very good. Uh, obviously, the first one you don't want to start the project before you get your permit because that's going to cost you extra money and a lot of violation notices um, most of the time. Uh, visiting the site's a good idea. It's always a good idea to visit the site so you know what you're getting into. Um, hire a surveyor, not so necessarily needed, but the best, best answer would be get a good plan together before you even start the project. That's gonna save you time, money, and a lot of headaches down the road. So make sure you 
have a good plan, go through all those the 13 requirements. Uh, those are needed before the project starts. Um, and you shouldn't be even starting the project or even uh, allowing a permit to be issued until you get those 13 requirements on your on the requirements. So start with a good specifics plan is the ideal one. All right, and then I'll uh, move on to the final one here. All right, what are some uh, important things needed for the SESC plan requirements? Timing and sequence of the project, control measures uh, with proper installation instructions, uh, detailed site plan, and then all of the above. So I'm gonna take a second here, and it looks like this one is gonna be pretty decisive. Go ahead and close it out and show you the results. Certainly hope this is the correct answer. Very good, you're correct. All those are required and should be used in, a, in your plan. Um, this timing and sequence, sometimes we, a lot of times we don't see uh, and it causes you the problems of um, down the road if you're not planning the, the timing and like finishing a project or starting a project, you good, good timing. Uh, control measures are the other problem that we always see, it's they're not uh, installed right or maintained properly. Um, and those project problems also. Um, and again, detailed plant site plan is important. The more detail you can have on your, on your plans, the better off you're gonna be. So at that time, I'll take, we'll take some questions. All right, thanks, Mike. I'm gonna actually turn my camera on here for a minute. Um, we received two questions during this section. And actually, Mike, I'm gonna give you a break and I'll go ahead and answer them. Okay. Um, one of the questions asked for some clarification on the legal description that's required on the soil erosion plan. Um, the legal description is usually an essential component of the deed for the property. So the best place to find your legal description that's required under 1703 is going to be on the deed of that property. Um, it usually uses like the lot and block system. And that's because um, we don't want to just accept an address as a legal descri description because sometimes the names of the streets change. So that's why we refer back to the same thing that they use on the deeds. Um, so for the SESC agencies, when you're checking the plan and you're looking for that legal description, the best place is it's gonna be that paragraph that comes off the deed for um, that piece of property. The second um, wasn't necessarily a question, but asked for some clarification on the inspections that are re required by the SESC agencies. So Jake kind of touched on this um, in his presentation. So there's, there's three times when inspections really need to be done. They need to be done before the project starts so that the SESC agency can get a really good idea of what that site looks like, what the natural drainage looks like. Um, you know, if it's a bunch of trees and we're taking out all the trees because we're gonna build a commercial building. Um, inspections have to be done during active construction, not just once during active construction, but consistently through active instruction, um, construction. So when we come in to audit an agency, we are looking for those consistent inspections to be done. What we normally see is at a minimum of once a month, unless you have a matrix that says something different. Um, so some of the agencies create matrices in the sense that it says, you know, if we have a site that, you know, is closer to water than other ones, we're going to inspect them more frequently. The bottom line is as an SESC agency, you have to be inspecting the sites to make sure there's, there's compliance um, with those sites and that those sites are, are routinely being checked. So if you have a site that's a problem, if there's a lot of violations issued, um, obviously you're probably gonna be there more than once a month. 
because part 91 requires that the issues be addressed at a maximum of five days after the, um, the, the issues observed. So you may be doing an inspection there one week and then you might be back within a week to make sure that those issues have been addressed. And then finally, an inspection should always be done um, before the SESC permit is closed out. And the reason for that is to make sure that the site's stabilized, that everything's wrapped up, and that you're not going to have any issues with um, in regards to soil erosion once that um, permit's actually closed out. Um, we just received another question. It says, do you have a preferred contour interval? Um, no, that's really, I don't believe so, not on 1703. It just says that the contours and slopes have to be um, included on the plan. So we pretty, the interval, if an agency wants to, they can require a specific interval, but we do not have a specific interval. But what we would expect to see is to be able to tell from the contours that are on the plan, which way the water is going to travel, um, which way the discharge is going to follow, things of that nature. Um, do we have any other questions? Because that looks like the last one I came to. Yeah, I don't have any others coming in. Sure. Okay, perfect. So with that, um, I think we can go ahead and move on to um, Danielle's quest, uh, section. Thanks, guys. Hi, uh, I'm Danielle McLean, and I work for the Lansing District Office, and I cover soil erosion and sedimentation control um, for that group, as well as some industrial stormwater. And so today we're going to go over the last module, and then we'll do um, a little bit of discussion and, and Q and A. Welcome to the comprehensive. SESC Plan Review and Design of Pressure Cores, Module 3. In this module, we will be discussing inspections, permitting, and enforcement in greater detail. The primary goal of Part 91 is to protect waters of the state and adjacent properties by minimizing erosion and controlling off-site sedimentation resulting from earth changes. There are three types of SESC agencies, county enforcing agencies or CEAs, municipal enforcing agencies or MEAs, and authorized public agencies or APAs. We will look at each of these agencies in more detail in a moment. EGLE provides training, compliance assistance, and program oversight for CEAs, MEAs, and APAs. Part 91 of the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act, or NREPA, and Part 17, the Associated Administrative Rules, comprise the SESC legislation for the state of Michigan. Both Part 91 and Rule 17 are enforceable. SESC agency staff should become familiar with both Part 91 and Rule 17. Now we will describe each type of SESC agency in more detail. Counties are required to administer and enforce Part 91 as county enforcing agencies or CEAs. Each county board designates an agency or department to act as the CEA and can implement Part 91 by means of a resolution or an ordinance. Section 9105 of Part 91 describes CEA responsibilities. Cities, villages, and townships can voluntarily administer a Part 91 program as a municipal enforcing agency or MEA and must pass an ordinance to do so. Section 9106 of Part 91 describes MEA responsibility. State and local units of government that commonly undertake earth changes such as drain commissioners and road commissions can be designated as an APA. APAs must develop procedures and obtain approval from EGLE. Approved APAs are not required to obtain Part 91 permits from local SESC agencies but still must communicate with the local CEAs and MEAs about projects. 
Section 9110 of Part 91 describes APA responsibilities. As mentioned previously, EGLE provides training, compliance assistance, and program oversight for CEAs, MEAs, and APAs, and also promulgates rule and reviews ordinances and procedures. Now, let's look at the difference between a resolution and an ordinance. A resolution is a document stating that a county accepts Part 91 as written. Under a resolution, fines are sent to the state. Only CEAs can implement Part 91 through a resolution. An ordinance may be adopted by either a CEA or an MEA, and it's a document that may be written to be more restrictive than Part 91. Additionally, an ordinance can be written to ensure fines go to the local agency. Ordinances cannot be less restrictive than Part 91 and must be approved by EGLE. It should be noted that if an ordinance is written to be more restrictive than Part 91, it must still be within the scope of Part 91, and the agency must have the ability to enforce the language in the ordinance. All changes and updates to ordinances or resolutions must be reviewed and approved by EGLE. Therefore, draft changes should be submitted to EGLE for review before adoption. Inspections are an important component for running a successful SESC program and for managing a successful project or site. Inspections must be thorough, well-documented, and frequent enough to ensure compliance can be maintained. Thorough inspections include a complete site walkthrough and pictures are highly recommended for documentation purposes. Inspection frequency can depend on several factors such as proximity to surface water, soil type on site, and slope conditions. An inspection matrix is recommended to help ensure inspection frequency is adequate and consistent between sites. When prioritizing sites for inspections and inspection frequency, here are some factors to consider. Are steep slopes present on site? What is the soil type on site? What is the size of the project? What is the timeline for the project? Is the site near or adjacent to critical or sensitive areas such as wetlands? What is the current and proposed cover for the site? Is it currently vegetated? And when will the site be stabilized? Inspection frequencies may change over time as on-site conditions evolve. As mentioned previously, Inspections should be thorough and include a complete site walkthrough. EGLE may request to review inspection reports to ensure inspections are being conducted at an adequate frequency, that reports include adequate detail, and to review whether similar on-site conditions or issues were noted. If inadequate site conditions and SESC control measures, such as those shown in the pictures above, are noted during an inspection, a review of the inspection logs for the site should reflect similar conditions. If reviewed inspection logs do not note these inadequacies, additional follow-up will likely be necessary. SESC agencies are required to maintain documentation relevant to Part 91. It is recommended that records are retained for at least five years. Documentation to be retained includes, but is not limited to, Permit applications, SCSC plans, permits, inspection reports, and compliance and enforcement documents. Enforcing agencies are responsible to regulate earth changes at sites regardless of whether or not the site is permitted. Even though a site may not require a permit, it must still maintain site conditions compliant with Part 91. Therefore, it may become necessary for agency staff to inspect unpermitted sites and even issue compliance or enforcement actions for sites with uncontrolled erosion or off-site discharges of sediment. All SESC permits are required to have state prescribed conditions and information on every permit. An example SESC permit containing the minimum required information can be found on EGLE's SESC webpage. 
Agency specific permit conditions can also be used to help drive compliance. Agencies should consider adding permit specific conditions to issued permits. Examples of permit specific conditions include required weekly street sweeping and specific inlet protection to be used. Additional examples include requiring a deadline for construction of sediment basins or stormwater ponds and a mandatory deadline for vegetation of spoil piles. The following four slides will provide an overview of permit exemptions. However, Part 91 and Rule 17 should be consulted for specific details as not all exemptions will be covered. The acts of logging and mining are exempt. However, associated access roads and ancillary activities are not exempt. The definition of mining does not include the removal of clay, gravel, sand, peat, or topsoil. Therefore, the removal of these materials is not exempt and still required permits. In most cases, oil and gas exploration and development is exempt from obtaining an SESC permit if permitted under Part 615 or Part 625 with an SESC plan approved by EGLE under Part 615 or Part 625. Normal road and driveway maintenance that does not increase the length or width of the road or driveway and that will not contribute sediment to lakes or streams is exempt. Some additional exemptions commonly encountered include but are not limited to minor earth changes stabilized within 24 hours, residential gardening with no raising of the natural elevation, residential post holes with no additional grading or earth change, and residential tree, shrub, and stump removal not to exceed 100 square feet. It should be noted that these exemptions are only valid if the earth change activities do not result in or contribute to soil erosion or sedimentation of the waters of the state or a discharge of sediment off-site. Maintaining compliance at sites is an important part of implementing an effective SESC program. SESC agencies should have a set of compliance and enforcement procedures that clearly outline the various steps to enforce compliance on sites. The procedures should provide a clear, consistent path for moving through the enforcement process if escalated enforcement is needed for a site. Some compliance and enforcement options agencies may use include the following. Double permit fee, requiring a permit for a site, bond, cash, certified check, or irrevocable letter of credit, fines, cease and desist, stop work order, liens, court injunction, and corrective actions. Enforcing agencies should always consult corporate counsel to ensure compliance and enforcement actions are legal, enforceable, and appropriate. In some cases, monetary penalties may be necessary. Section 9121 of Part 91 sets maximum monetary penalties. Enforcing agencies can set up individual fee schedules that cannot exceed the limits set in Part 91. When a site is fully stabilized, the permit can be terminated. Rule 17 defines stabilization as the establishment of vegetation or the proper placement, grading, or covering of soil to ensure its resistance to soil erosion, sliding, or other earth movement. The final determination of whether a site is stabilized can be tricky and a complete site walkthrough should be completed before making a determination. Additionally, all temporary SESC measures should be removed prior to permit termination. Areas near surface water will require a close inspection to ensure vegetation, riprap, and other stabilization measures are adequate to prevent erosion and sedimentation. Areas of sparse vegetation will require additional time for vegetation growth and may also require additional seed and mulch. Temporary SESC measures should be left in place and maintained until the site is fully stable. If you have questions, 
contact the Eagle SESC staff person assigned to your account. This map can be found on the Eagle SESC webpage. Thank you for your participation and interest in this training. Your efforts will ultimately help protect the invaluable surface waters of this state. All right, I have the final three polling questions for you here. All right, first one, I'll go ahead and launch. They should be seeing a pop up here. All right, under a construction stormwater notice of coverage, the operator's weekly inspection should include the review of. Um, we have three choices here in the disturbed area and all associated BMPs in the SCSC plan, the site boundary and the areas adjacent to waters of the state, the general site area, and whatever measures are in place. Let's go ahead and take a minute to pick the best uh, choice you think is correct. All right, we're getting close here. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this out, going once, going twice, and I'll share the results. All right, you should see them in front of you there. All right, so I think I did frame that question to be a little bit tricky on purpose, but the correct answer is the disturbed area and all associated BMPs in the SCSC plan. I think, um, one of the most important things to understand when you're dealing with a notice of coverage and a, a permit from the state of Michigan for stormwater is that our expectation is that your inspectors are really reviewing the entire disturbed area and all the measures that are in your SCSC plan. Um, the bottom line there that the general site area and whatever measures are in place, I think that's what a lot of people assume they're supposed to do. Um, but really a thorough inspection and, and a properly documented inspection would review the entire area and all those BMPs that are in place. Um, you know, walking the full site perimeter, looking at the silt fence, checking silt sack inserts. And these are things that should be done once a week. All right. Thanks, Danielle. I'll move on to the next one if we're ready. You should see it popping up. Do state approved APAs need to obtain SESC permits from local SESC agencies? So this one's a yes or no, so you have a 50 50 chance if you don't know it. So give it your best shot. All right, a couple more seconds here. It looks like the majority of you have chosen. So I'm going to go ahead and Stop, close the poll and show you the results. And there you have it. All right. Yeah, so the answer really is no with an asterisk, actually. Um, so again, I just wanted to give you guys some thought provoking questions here. In most cases, APAs are not gonna need to uh, obtain an SCSC permit from a local agency, however, there are circumstances where they may need to, and that would be um, including some situations where the activity that's being performed doesn't necessarily fall within the procedures of that APA. Um, and that can happen for a number of reasons. Maybe something new is being built. And it's kind of part of like a, a municipality system, or maybe it's a, a conglomerative project through multiple agencies where the APA may be doing something, but but not all the things within their procedures. So what's important to note here is if you are part of an APA, you still need to think about what you're doing because if it falls outside of your procedures, you need to start thinking about um, your SCSC permit. Also, that in mind, note that you'll still need a notice of coverage even if your site doesn't necessarily have to go through a local SCSC agency if it's over five acres of disturbance. 
Okay, and uh, got one more poll question here. All right, we made it to our last one. Uh, can an ordinance be less restrictive than Part 91? Another 50-50 shot, yes or no? Okay, looks like this one is a little more a little more decisive on this one. So I'll go ahead and yeah, people are voting faster, so I'll go ahead and close it out and share. Ta -da. All right. Yep. I believe all of you pretty much understood that. No, you cannot have an ordinance that's less restrictive than Part 91. Part 91 is kind of like the base of what you can have for your soil erosion, and then ordinances always go kind of in more restrictive fashion from there. It doesn't have to be a lot. It could be as simple as they just added a stop work order, but if you're going to have a stop work order, you should have an ordinance. Um, it wouldn't just be a resolution of Part 91. So those were my questions. Um, and then I have a few discussion points to go over um, after we take some questions from the group. Uh, I'm not seeing any others come in on my end. Did you have anything, Cheryl, that you wanted to? No, I, didn't I, have any, I don't have any questions per se. Um, Danielle, did you have anything else to go over or no? Yeah, I, I just have a couple of discussion points of things that yeah. I thought might be important to touch on. Okay, perfect. Um, so not too much, and I won't drag it out here for anybody, but a few things that I thought would be important to um, kind of bring up. One of the things I noticed is that there's often a lot of confusion regarding um, construction stormwater in Part 91. So I wanted to kind of take just a minute to clarify those differences um, and get people really on board with understanding when they need a construction stormwater permit versus soil erosion. Um, so a lot of times I will go out to a site and they will not realize that they had something that they were required to do for construction stormwater. Uh, construction stormwater is going to apply to any site that is greater than one acre in size that has a point source discharge uh, to a surface water because at that point you really should be doing your construction stormwater inspections and you would need a certified construction stormwater operator. Uh, and that starts under permit by rule at one acre. But then, of course, when we get to the five acres, um, that's when we start to deal with the notice of coverage. And facility or sites that are over that size need to check and see if that permit's appropriate for them. Uh, it's not part of your Part 91 permit that you're required to get through the county or whoever your enforcing agency is. Uh, it's a separate and additional thing. And where we seem to bump into that problem a lot, at least in my area, is uh, housing developments. They just do not seem to realize that that's an additional requirement. So I wanted to take a moment just to clarify that they are entirely separate structures, even though they play together well. Um, and I don't know if Cheryl had anything she wanted to add to that, but I just wanted to reiterate that they really both need to be thought up separately and both heftily paid attention to because you don't want to not have a permit when you need it and get fines for that. Oh, I think you about covered it, which is that they're two very different programs with different requirements. So it's important that, um, you know, like Danielle said, that the sites follow the requirements for each of the programs and meet the requirements so they're not in violation with either one yeah um and then another point that i had kind of in line with this last video deals with apas if you're not an apa it might not be as important but you might interact with an apa that has this um going on if you do routine maintenance activities and you do not make soil erosion plans for them they need to be part of your procedures so if you are part of an APA and you haven't looked through your procedures in a while, but maybe you've started doing some things you hadn't done in the past, it'd be a good time to review that and make sure that your procedures are appropriate. 
and any changes you make to the procedures need to come to us for review and approval. But unless it's part of your approved procedures, you wouldn't need to have a soil erosion control plan for it. Um, and then kind of just the last touching point would be uh, stabilization. One of the things that I realized if you are an enforcing agency is that there can be a little bit of discretion as to when a site's considered stabilized versus not. Um, but I had had a few sites last summer where people closed out an SCSC permit before the full site was stabilized. You know, they just had a couple areas that had, um, you know, soil erosion blankets, but it wasn't permanently stabilized. And these are the kind of things that, you know, we expect it to be a permanently stabilized site before you would close those permits. Something to keep in mind if you are um, the actual like site crew, you really shouldn't be requesting termination until your site is fully stabilized, whatever that might be. If it's grass, if it's rock, uh, those are the kinds of things that I expect to see. I'm not a big fan of walking out to a site where a permit has just been closed and they ask me to terminate my notice of coverage only to realize that there are portions of the site that just have straw blanketing on them. So while we are pretty fluid in what stabilization, like what one person might deem stabilized and another may not, um, not having permanent control measures in place is not, not gonna be an acceptable thing for, for terminating your SCSC permit or your notice of coverage. And I think that's pretty much it, Cheryl. So unless you have something else, I'm done. All right, so it looks like we had um, two topics that have come up in the question chat. Um, the first one is, how can I develop good procedures and do we have examples? So I can answer that. Um, procedures for APAs. Um, if you are an APA and you're going to redo your procedures or if you think you're gonna become an APA, the best thing to do is to reach out to your district staff. Uh, we do have um, copies of approved procedures for other agencies that we can provide you um, as guidance. So definitely um, your number one resource as an SCS, SCSC agency is your district staff. And that's why we're here. We're here to assist you and assist anybody that has questions. Um, and then Danielle, I'll send you this next question and it says, so my question is when there is a residential soil erosion permit, if the homeowner does not need soil erosion prevention devices, do they still need to get the permit? That is the one thing I have conflict with with the customers. All right, so let me make sure I fully understand it. Um, it sounds like, are they, specifically asking if they have a site that um, doesn't need a permit, do they still need to put soil erosion control measures in place? Uh, it says, so my question is, when there is a residential soil erosion permit, so it sounds like the site would be required to have a permit. Mm -hmm. If the homeowner does not need erosion prevention devices, do they still need the permit? Well, I think the answer to that is they need the permit if it meets the requirements for obtaining a per permit under Part 91. Now, Part 91 does have some exemptions and waivers, um, but that would be on a case-by-case -case basis. So I don't think we can answer that um, question fully, right? Because we would have to have more information regarding that specific site. So. Um, for the person that sent in that question, if you would like, I'm going to recommend that you reach out um, to your district staff person in your area or the area where this project is taking place. And let's open that discussion with them and then we can get some more information from you. Yeah. Um, and that looks like that's the end of the questions on our end, at least from over here. So. Yeah, I don't have any more, Carol. Okay, That's all perfect. I have.
So I think that kind of wraps it up. Um, like I said at the beginning, I hope you guys would enjoy this as much as we've enjoyed putting it on. Um, you know, I, Danielle, Jake, and Mike, go ahead. Jake looks like he wanted to add something there to. Uh, oh. It was just, uh, it was just on that last question. I was just going to add because this does come up on sites that I have a lot. Um, I don't know if it provides clarification for them or not, but there is sites that need an SESC permit that might not need soil erosion control measures installed on site. Um, it sounded to me like that's what they were kind of getting at. Um, so if you, if you have a very flat site that you know is still meets the requirements of needing, it's over an acre in size, so it needs an SESE permit. It doesn't necessarily mean that there has to be you know silt fence installed or some sort of soil erosion control measure on site. Um, so that's all I was going to add to that. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Danielle, for pointing that out. I didn't see that. Um, but again, I, I think this wraps it all up. I want to thank um, Jake, Danielle, and Mike for presenting and putting a lot of this together, along with Brandy, Matt, and Ann. We're the ones who developed the videos that you guys watched. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and I hope you did enjoy it as much as we enjoyed putting it together. Our plan um, is to create and have additional things like this for the program in the future, maybe more site specific or program specific. Um, so definitely look out for the emails and anything else we might be putting out. Um, if you have any other follow-up questions, I would recommend that you reach out to your district staff. Again, that's what we're here for. We're here, you know, we're your number one resource. We're here to help you. So um, don't be shy, give us a call. We can talk through it. We can brainstorm and hopefully help you guys out. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan. Yeah, thanks Cheryl. Um, the only other thing I have is just to let you know what to expect next from us. Uh, just a couple emails we'll be sending out. One will have a, a survey, so please let, let us know what you thought of the webinar. And then a certificate for just continuing education hours. Uh, and then we'll send another email out that will have a link to the recording. So you'll be able to watch this again. So uh, that's all I have. Yeah, thank you all for tuning in and for all the presenters today. I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you.